Is that working? Yes. Um, I'm Blake. I'm from the Georgia Institute for Global Health in Sydney. Um, but I'm going to talk today about a bit of work we've been doing about developing a priority, prioritised research agenda in the Asia-Pacific region. Um, just a quick acknowledgement to all, the, to all my co-authors and the funders of the work. Um, as you guys all know, universal healthcare has become a driving force in the global health community. Um, and primary healthcare has been acknowledged as essential to being able to achieve universal healthcare. Um, financing interventions um, have been proposed as a means to potentially accelerate progress towards universal health coverage and a means to strengthen primary care systems um, by incentivizing appropriate and quality primary care. Um, so the Asia Pacific region, um, very diverse. It's home to some of the biggest countries, uh, it's home to the biggest countries in the world in India, which I'm sorry isn't highlighted there, and uh, China. Um, as well as the smallest in the Pacific Island nations. Um, so the objective for the work was to determine what the most important research needs are for policymakers in the area of primary healthcare financing interventions in the Asia Pacific. And we sort of broke this up into two uh, smaller aims. Um, what gaps exist in the current evidence base um, for policymakers looking to implement, uh, looking to implement policies towards universal he health coverage, sorry. And the second was what are the priority areas for further research for the key stakeholders in the region. Um, so this study formed part of a broader project. Um, I just found out overnight it's been accepted for publication in BMJ Global Health as part of a uh, special edition looking at the organisation and financing of uh, primary healthcare in low and middle income countries around the world. Um, our, our specific component focused on the organisation and financing of primary healthcare in the Asia Pacific region and th uh, this presentation is just looking at the financing components. Um, so for both of these, we implemented a two-phase approach. Um, the first was a systematic review to identify the, the current evidence in the field um, and find the gaps. And the second was a modified eDelphi process um, with key stakeholders across the region to determine the pr top priority areas for future, future research. Um, so the first part, the systematic review, um, I'll go very quickly through this. Essentially, we were looking for evidence in three key areas. Um, there had to be evaluations of financing interventions um, targeting primary health care systems. Um, they were published between 2008 and 2018, so the last 10 years, and they had to be based in the lower and middle income countries of the South Asia and East Asia and Pacific regions. Um, so this is the broad findings. Um, 3,001 abstracts were screened and we ended up with 31 included articles. Um, of those, there were 21 original peer-reviewed publications, 10 systematic reviews, and 10 grey literature reports. Um, broadly, the studies were dominated by a small group of nations within the, the region, um, in particular China which accounted for nine of the articles. Uh, in terms of the interventions, the most common intervention study was looking at the removal of user fees or public insurance, um, followed by pay for performance initiatives, outsourcing um, or changes to ownership structures, and uh, the use of patient incentives. Um, there weren't too many consistent findings across this relatively limited evidence base, um, but they did consistently em emphasize the importance of contextual factors um, that, were that were often found to impede implementation or scale up of the interventions. Um, from this, we created an evidence gap map. 
Um, I've included the link there because I think it is quite a good resource. Um, if you log on there, you get to this screen. And basically, you can click on, it divides all the studies up by certain categories. And if you click on it, you can get through to the studies and the abstracts and results and things in there. Um, looking at the financing part specifically, um, there, basically what this is saying is there's not, not a lot of evidence to guide um, policymakers in this area. Um, we use this to inform the second phase of the study. Um, we pulled out these five key uh, gaps, and we used these gap we presented these gaps to the stakeholders of the eDelphi process in the second phase of the study. Um, so you can see that the gaps, I guess, they're pretty broad. They cover most of most of the field, really. Um, then in the second phase, we started with those. Uh, evidence gaps presented it to a, our expert panel, which included 22 um, primary healthcare stakeholders from the Asia Pacific region. Um, the eDelphi process was carried out over three three phases. Um, basically, in round one, we presented those broad topics um, to the panel and asked them to rank them in order of priority. Um, and also to highlight the key, the key questions of interest um, to the panel members. Uh, in round two, we collated all the questions that have been collected in round one, um, and again, asked, for, uh, asked the stakeholders to prioritize the questions in order of importance. Um, and then finally, we did the same thing again. Um, so what did we find? Um, the, the top research priority was found to be looking, uh, research uh, looking at financing inventions to protect the poor from impoverishing payments. Um, but in general, there were three, there were interventions at the community level, the um, service provider level, and also the system level. Um, my time is up, so I might stop there. 30 seconds, I'll go through my conclusions. Um, so basically the, the main points are the, the current literature provides limited guidance on the use of primary healthcare financing interventions to guide policymakers in the area. Um, the key research priorities, like I just said, focused on um, a broad spectrum, so ranging from community level interventions to promote access to primary health care and financial protection, um, service level financing models, and system level funding uh, policies. Um, there's a need for pragmatic as well as uh, rigorous research that can account for the complexity of um, both, I guess, primary health care or health care generally, um, but also the, the low and middle income context that we were looking at. And Finally, probably the fact that this type of co-design approach uh, engaging researchers and stakeholders to, to um, work out some research priorities. Thank you. Okay, uh, firstly, let me thank you, Professor Lu, because we've seen each other in two years ago in Xiamen University. And then, yeah, uh, I, my name is Li Jiajing. I came from the School of Public Health in Shenzhen University. And, okay, let me, okay. and today we're talking about the topic about uh, medical debt among uh, middle and low income families in China. And uh, uh, why 
why do we care about this topic? Because medical debt is the impact of long-term medical financial burden on households. And um, as we all know, bad health and bad debt often coincide, so does catastrophic health expenditure. And we, uh, the medical debt for these families is just like adding insult into journey. And medical debt is a um, common global health economic issues, as we can see from the review. And uh, families in the US or the Britain and uh, some developing countries like India, Vietnam, and uh, uh, Cambodia also uh, occurring, uh, also facing the, with this problem. But uh, surprisingly, few studies have uh, examined the financial debt and poverty in China. And uh, one study found that uh, the uh, proportion of poverty families having medical debt was about 60% to 70% in China. And the chronic disease and hospitalization have a uh, strong association with the presence of a large amount of medical debt. So we think there is a lack of nationwide studies about medical debt and it impact factors in normal families in China. So uh, our focus is to solve the problem. Uh, we obtained the data from uh, China household finance surveys in 2015, covering every member in almost 4, 000, uh, 40,000 households across 22 province in China, and we focused on the uh, low and middle income families. The medical debt was definited as a response to the following. How much did you borrow for medical treatment, including bank and credit union loans and private loans, and uh, borrowing from friends or family members? So this independent, uh, independent variables was included in this model, and we used Topic, mo uh, topic model to uh, analyze. And, uh, in the first part of the result, make a geographical distribution of incidence of medical debt in China. As we can see from this paragraph, uh, this graph, uh, uh, in Henan and Shanxi and Mongolia province, like here, the uh, lighter yellow uh, in the map, uh, they, are, uh, they have a higher incidence, and uh, uh, no matter in low-income families or the middle-income families, the CA is, uh, the concentration index is negative. So we think the poor families are more likely to experience medical debt. And uh, we also analyze the income and medical financial burden of these families. Uh, as we can see from this chart, the medical debt incidence of middle income families, uh, uh, in middle income families was 2.42% uh, and 3.92% uh, uh, for low income families, but only less one than 1% 1 for high income families. And uh, comparing with uh, the study in Britain, India, and Cambodia, and other countries, we think medical debt incidence of China's household is much lower. However, uh, by mean ranking, the medical debt of uh, low-income households was roughly their net income for two years and a half. Even the medium income households need seven months of their total income to repay. So compared with the uh, uh, repayment uh, period in European countries and American, we think once the medical debt happens in China, the medical debt occupies this family longer time to repay. So it's really a long-term long -term medical um, uh, health a financial impact. And uh, this part is the uh, influence factors on medical debt of middle income and low income households. As we see from the uh, first one line, only middle income households 
their medical debt was affected by per capita income and uh, uh, their household asset. And the catastrophic increase the household medical debt by uh, 70, uh, 17 US dollars or 18 US, US dollars. As the main resource of income for families, the health status, working conditions, hospitalization, and medical insurance of middle-aged people have a critical impact on medical debt. When we can see the hospitalization uh, students' hospitalization prompted the medical debt of low-income low families by 45 uh, US dollars, which is a leading contributor to the medical debt among all the family members. And um, um, as a result of uh, insurance, uh, the existing medical insurance policies offered few protection for these middle-aged people and the students. So, uh, so we can get these conclusions. Firstly, uh, government department or the health-related longitude studies should pay more attention to medical debt in the wide definition because we take a, a relative narrow definition here. And uh, medical insurance or other social relief system should provide appropriate financial support to families with medical debt, especially for low-income households, so as to improve the uh, equity of health and further relieve the economic burden of disease. Like, uh, as we can see from the above analysis result, the low-income um, households was uh, the low-income um, households uh, has a big incident, uh, much uh, opportunity to acquiring the medical debt. And business insurance for students' hospitalization modifies the current residence basic medical insurance for improving the protect of students' hospitalization may effectively reduce the family's long-term medical financial burden. And, uh, okay, that's all. Thank you for your listening. Okay. Um, if not, then we'll move to the third presentation. So uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you for being here this early morning. Um, so today I'm going to talk on uh, sex-related inequalities in publicly funded health insurance uh, schemes coverage in five southern Indian states. So publicly financed health insurance schemes are those uh, which are fi financed by state or central government. They are usually non-contributory. Uh, it's a household pro-poor model. Since, two, since 2007, several PFHI schemes were introduced in India, both at state and central level, targeting the, non -poor, uh, the poor uh, poverty sit poor uh, citizens. Uh, however, exclusion arises at various stages uh, due to lack of awareness, in, due to the in inbuilt design, the inclusion criteria, uh, level of coverage, claim process, and by, it further varies by income, education, your location, age, etc., etc. We also know that men and women have different mortality and morbidity patterns, thus equal coverage of health services may not treat both the sexes equitably. So we wanted to explore how does sex interacts with other axes of inequalities, and uh, are we seeing inequalities or inequities? So uh, in India, the proportion of households at least one usual member covered under any health insurance or scheme uh, increased from 5% in 2005-06 uh, to 29% in 2015-16. And this, this increase were, was more so among the southern states of India. So if we see, uh, if we disaggregate the PFHI's coverage by sex, we see that uh, the darker portion 
the coverage was higher in southern states, Telangana, Andhra Pradesh, Tamil Nadu, Kerala, and Karnataka. And the second thing that we saw here that the, the coverage was more so similar across male and female. So that's why we wanted to see that among these better performing stage, st uh, states, whether, whether the sex, uh, how the sex interacts with uh, other axes of inequalities. So we used the uh, demographic health survey, uh, also known as uh, National Family Health Survey, 2015-16. Uh, we use data and World Health Organization's Health Equity Assessment Toolkit. Um, uh, separate analysis was done for men and women in each of the five states. We accessed overall uh, inequalities uh, by location, employment, marital status, eight dimensions of inequalities, age, wealth, education, religion, and caste, which is also ethnicity. So we measured relative inequality uh, using ratios for locations, for our binary dim dimensions, locations, employment, metal status, relative concentra uh, concentration index for our ordered dimensions, age, income, and education, and uh, teal index for our un unordered dimensions like religion and caste. So uh, an ideal concentration curve for PFHI, uh, PFHIS coverage that I was expecting was that in the bottom, bottom 40 quintile of the population receives greater uh, PFHIS coverage. That's, that is, inequality is not inequity. That is intended in the design of the PFHIS. However, when I looked at the concentration curves for uh, all, the, all, all the selected states, I saw that, um, that they were somewhere close to the line of inequalities, uh, line of equality. And we see pro-poor inequality was, though it is in design of uh, PFHI, as I, as I already mentioned, and it does not reflect inequity, but high coverage, uh, but high coverage in, in the upper two quintiles, uh, in uh, Telangana, Karnataka, Andhra Pradesh, it's, may be inequity, may reflect inequity. There were some other findings uh, related to uh, age, uh, religion, employment, mental status, that uh, age was, uh, among men, it was found to be uh, uh, equally distributed, but however, among uh, uh, women, it was concentrated among the older age groups. Uh, Religion-related inequality was sig uh, significant among women in Kerala and Andhra Pradesh. Employment-related inequality was significant among women in Telangana, Karnataka, Andhra Pradesh, and was in insignificant in Kerala and Tamil Nadu. Marital status-related inequality was only significant in women belonging to Telangana, Andhra Pradesh. Relatively, more uh, uh, unmarried women had coverage than uh, then married women, and mind that among men, uh, among men, all those inequalities were found to be insignificant. So um, the, uh, some of the limitations were that it was a self-reported data. We did not have any data for the utilization of those who were covered under this, these schemes. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, and then uh, we did, uh, the, the secondary data did, do not collect data for all genders. This, this, this was uh, our, uh, another limitation. Notwithstanding all these, um, uh, we, uh, we see that the coverage is broadly reaching the, targe uh, uh, the um, uh, design target. However, there are some exceptions. High coverage in the upper two quantiles of those who are covered needs further probing. Um, coverage among older female age groups, uh, implications have to be explored. Uh, the PFHIS inequalities related to progress uh, vary by state by state and may be greater among women. Um, more intersectional research is needed which can guide the program design. More data uh, also on uh, which gives us the utilization of those covered under PFHIS is required for uh, these analyses. Uh, further, um, uh, we know that there's uh, recently uh, relaunched uh, program in India uh, at national level, uh, which is a central government, central scheme, uh, which claims to be the highest in the world. Um, impact evalu evaluation of PFHIS on health outcomes and the financial burden also is needed, especially in the light of this uh, recently introduced scheme. Uh, thank you. For any questions, please contact me at my email ID. Uh, I'm from George Institute, India. Thank you.
question for clarification from this paper. Um, okay, if not, then we'll, we'll move to the fourth presentation. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, my name is Rebecca Ross. I'm from Palladium Health Policy Plus Project, and today I'm going to discuss methodology and results of an analysis of changes in private hospital efficiency before and after the initiation of Indonesia's single-payer national health insurance scheme, Jaminan Kesehatan Nasional, or JCAN. The USAID-funded Health Policy Plus project conducted a comprehensive assessment of JCAN together with the national team for the acceleration of poverty reduction, TMP2K, from 2016 through 2018. The assessment organized around four perspectives, payers, patients, providers, and private sector. And there were many policy questions which the assessment overall aimed to understand, but today I'll focus specifically on the efficiency analysis completed using data made available from our private hospital survey. Initially, 2014, JKN had planned to reach universal insurance coverage by 2019, but there's concern that JKN payment mechanisms incentivize over-treatment and, and hence inefficiencies for the scheme, runs a deficit. The scheme administrator, BPJSK, pays contracted hospitals for outpatient and inpatient care via the Indonesia case-based groups, ENA CBGs, a diagnosis-related reimbursement where payment rates are determined by types of diagnoses, severity of the condition, geography, and hospital classification type. Because Indonesia does not have many national treatment guidelines, excluding services for diseases like HIV and TB, which are traditionally donor-funded, providers have some flexibility to optimize facility resources for treatment procedures, interventions, and drug administration. Some suggest that there are increased instances of overtreatment, financial strain on hospitals, because tariff rates are set lower than cost of care and possible compromises in quality of care. And unlike public hospitals, for which the government continues to fund personnel costs and capital expenditures, private facilities must fund most costs from direct revenue. They must also procure medicine and commodity needs from the market, whereas public-owned hospitals can access the procurement system implemented by the government. Given that hospital expenditures account for 80% of JCAN healthcare expenditure, and as of 2017, when data collection started, over 60% of JCAN affiliated hospitals were in the private sector. This analysis aimed to discern whether private hospital use of resources has improved since JCAN initiation, that is, whether technical efficiency had changed. There have been few studies that have assessed technical efficiency in Indonesia hospitals since JCAN initiation, and those that have have considered only public hospitals and not whether or not the change is related to JCAN. So we designed a two-phase study. We first used data envelopment analysis, DEA, to measure technical efficiency of hospitals both pre- and post-JCAN initiation, 2013 and 2016, respectively. DEA is a linear technique to quantify efficiency by assessing the proportional change of multiple inputs and outputs used. We created four separate DEA models to differentiate between inpatient and outpatient departments in each year. The models were oriented to maximize outputs, assuming that hos hospitals plan budgets in advance and do not have the ability to quickly adjust investments in infrastructure, equipment, or labor. With DEA model, we create efficiency scores for each facility. We then used the generated efficiency scores to assess whether changes in efficiency were related to JKN. We developed two difference and difference truncated regression models for inpatient and outpatient departments with covariates including geographic group, urban versus rural hospital setting, population density, hospital classification type, and hospital ownership. 
Data used in this analysis was collected from December 2017 through January 2018 by HP Plus and TMP2K in a survey of private hospitals to better understand overall changes in capacity, utilization, and finances before and after JCAN initiation. Operational data, including data on outpatient load, inpatient capacity, and occupancy, services available, and human resources were collected from 73 private hospitals in 11 provinces. Hospitals were stratified by province, classification, BPJSK, contracting status, and facility ownership. The survey overall was administered to 61 contracted hospitals and 12 non-contracted hospitals. And survey instruments collected quantitative and qualitative data from 2013 and 2016 with specific inputs and outputs used in the DEA and difference and difference models detailed to the right here. Before generating the efficiency scores, we also looked at the statistics of inputs in both 2013 and 2016. Installed capacity increased among both contracted and non-contracted hospitals between 2013 and 2016. As you can see here, inpatient beds and human resources, including general practitioners, nurses, and specialists, increased among both BPJSK and non-contracted hospitals. Only the number of outpatient clinics decreased between years in non-contracted hospitals. Next, we consider descriptive changes in outpatient in the DEA models, and in general, outputs increased among BPJSK contracted hospitals and decreased among the non-contracted hospitals. Here we show inpatient days, average number of outpatient department services, and surgical services. The facilities contracted with BPJSK showed larger increases in services provided. The increase was not related to JCAN. So now we show the average efficiency scores or the output of the DEA model. We find that average efficiency pooled across all hospitals in the sample increased in both inpatient and outpatient departments between 2013 and 2016. But the trends differed from the two, in the two different contract status groups. Among non-contracted hospitals, average inpatient department efficiency decreased 4.7% and outpatient department efficiency increased 14%. Among contracted hospitals, average efficiency increased both in inpatient and outpatient departments, which may be explained in part by the slight increases in installed capacity and human resources relative to very large increases in inpatient and outpatient outputs. This table shows results of the two difference in difference regression models. Our analyses suggest that contracting with BPJSK is significantly associated with increased efficiency in inpatient departments holding all other factors constant, there's a statistically positive effect of contracting with BPJSK on efficiency. However, contracting status did not significantly affect changes in outpatient department efficiency. Results also indicate that private hospitals with greater specialization, type B, had higher efficiency than general type D hospitals. So our analyses found that while contracting with BPJSK improved efficiency in inpatient departments of private hospitals, there's no clear evidence that changes in outpatient department efficiency are related to JKN. Mechanisms to ensure quality of care seem to have improved, but no evidence links these JKN policies or BPJS contracting. So our recommendations tie back into the private sector study, um, the broader private sector study, and we we know that in Indonesia, the government has piloted mechanisms like global budget ceilings to curb and contain rising expenditures of hospital care. So we recommend that the rates be aligned with metrics for standards of care to be sure that sufficient level of quality of care is provided. We also recommend to ensure that private providers have access to the electronic catalog system for pharmaceutical and medical device procurement which is currently limited to public providers to ensure that they also are able to access competitive prices for inputs. Uh, third, we recommend greater coordination between BPJSK and the Ministry of Health to set requirements and standardize for contracted and non-contracted hospitals uh, for quality of care. And finally, routine monitoring of efficiency in hospitals like quality assurance systems to ensure and maintain efficiency in the contracted hospitals. Thank you. Thank you very much. Again, any burning question for clarification? Um, if not, uh, then we'll move to uh, the next paper, Investing in TB. Thank you. 
Is it on? Cool. Okay. Awesome. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Sri Prabhakaran. I'm a technical advisor at Palladium working on the USAID Health Policy Plus project. I'm presenting this on behalf of my colleague, Kathy Cantelmo, who couldn't be here today, unfortunately, and um, so her and the rest of the authors uh, should get full credit for this work. Um, so really quickly, to talk about, um, we're talking about uh, investing in TB in Cambodia and making the case for increased public spending. Uh, so in Cambodia, the TB mortality and TB incidence has improved drastically um, over the last 17 years, uh, but it's still two and a half times above the global average. So there is a significant need for increased investment. And at the moment, we see that the majority of the um, epidemic is funded through external funding, and so there is a need for increased domestic financing uh, to close this gap between um, the Cambodia's rates and the global average. And we can also see here that one in five uh, patients uh, experience catastrophic health costs uh, due to TB. So that's something that we also would like to address. So in order to advocate for increased resource allocation to TB from the government budget, the program needs to present evidence on how to invest in scaling up TB pre prevention, case detection, and treatment. While many countries have experience in developing investment cases that show how public investment in health results in improved health outcomes, very few explore the household economic benefits and even fewer consider the indirect costs uh, associated with being ill. So we have two, uh, two research questions here, the first looking at health benefits and the second looking at uh, the economic benefits. Uh, so in terms of um, the health impacts, we estimated how scaling up TB screening programs and rates, improving diagnostic algorithms and increasing coverage of child contact investigation and preventative therapy for PLHIV reduces TB incidence and mortality and compared this to a baseline scenario where intervention coverage and diagnostic algorithms stay the same as they are presently. And for household economic impacts, we estimated future household spending on both direct and indirect costs of TB under the baseline and scale-up scenarios. Direct costs refer to both medical and non-medical costs, such as transportation and associated with TB testing and treatment. Indirect costs refer to lost wages and dis-saving as a result of TB. So we have here a uh, kind of a map that shows um, the health-related effects, and then here we have the, uh, how it fall, flows through to both direct costs, uh, medical and non-medical, as well as reduced indirect costs, which is uh, lost wages and dis-saving. We can see here also that uh, these are the interventions are over the top of the scale-up scenario, and the um, scaled-up screening and contact investigation can also have a direct flow-on effect to reduced um, direct costs because it happens in the uh, community. So what were the methods? So again, we, we've, we've got two separate, uh, um, I guess, analyses that we're doing, and the first is um, looking at the health impacts. Uh, to estimate health impacts of improving TB case detection and treatment from 2018 to 2025, we applied a mathematical model called time impact, which uses epitrans, diagnostic algorithms, and TB intervention coverage to estimate the disease burden and how many people will receive TB services. The model takes into account different types of TB, including MDR-TB and HIV comorbidity in its calculations, and connects to an underlying demographic projection model. For estimating household impacts, uh, we used a model developed in Excel uh, that used uh, TB time data as, um, as a way to then look at TB spending, household income of TB patients, and lost productivity uh, from TB. A couple of the key limitations to note is that we do not estimate the cumulative cost due to premature death from TB or end-of-life costs borne by households, such as funeral expenses. So the results of, um, of, the, of the analysis show that um, really there's a big scale-up in the number of people that are tested in the scale-up scenario, but overall the number of people notified uh, remain uh, pretty, pretty similar under both scenarios. And that's due to reduced incidence from earlier detection and treatment of TB. Um, to go to the health uh, results, we have here, we can see that there's significant in both TB incidence and TB-related mortality. Um, 
And much of the reduction in TB incidence mortality is attributable to significantly scaling up the screening rate, which is the average time it takes to diagnose a person with TB. The model assumes that an active case finding expands. The average amount of time it takes to diagnose a person with TB will decrease from a year in 2018 to seven months in 2025. In terms of the health economic uh, output uh, or outcomes, um, scaling up and improving TB services in Cambodia uh, not only reduces the health outcomes, but it reduces the economic burden on, uh, on households. We estimate that currently TB direct and indirect costs borne by the individual exceed $90 million. And under the scale-up scenario, costs borne by patients are estimated to decrease by 36% from 2018 to 2025. Since the number of people notified and put on treatment are very similar under both scenarios, the difference in costs borne by individuals is due to two other things. First is a drastic reduction in mortality under the scale-up scenario, uh, which reduces lost wages from premature death, and that's 57% that's of the reduction. Um, scale-up of active case finding under the scale-up scenario reduces the average cost borne by an individual in accessing TB services as it requires fewer facility visits and time missed from work on average compared to passive case finding. Across both scenarios, the majority of costs borne by patients are for indirect costs, such as lost wages and disaving, resulting from missing time from work due to illness and seeking treatment. This is an important point as it is more difficult for the government to cover indirect costs borne by TB patients than direct costs that are uh, in a facility. So some of the results here, we can see that um, in 2018, more people face high TB costs as a percentage of household income under the scale-up scenario than under the baseline scenario because active face case finding methods are not fully scaled up. Um, and nearly 3,000 more people are notified and linked to treatment under the scale-up scenario compared to the baseline scenario. By 2025, active case finding is fully scaled up and the gap between the two scenarios in terms of number of people notified on treatment is smaller, resulting in fewer people facing high TB costs as a percentage of household income in the scale-up scenario versus the baseline scenario. However, you'll notice here that uh, there's not that much difference uh, in terms of the number of uh, individuals who are facing catastrophic costs. Um, and the reason for that uh, is because the active case finding approaches re, uh, reach slightly poorer segments of the population on average, and, and this suggests that subsidies and other assistance for households affected by TB are still needed, even as TB costs borne to patients decline over time. So what are our recommendations? Uh, TB patients face significant costs, uh, particularly indirect costs in terms of lost wages. Costs are either not covered by schemes such as the Health Equity Fund or patients are unaware that they can be reimbursed. Therefore, we recommend the following. Prioritize increasing in government investment in screening programs as this intervention leads to the greatest impacts in terms of reductions in incidence and mortality. Expand service delivery models that reduce financial burden to patients such as active case finding and community-based dots where patients do not need to travel to facility for treatment. And finally, explore options for expanding financial protection, which could include greater integration of TB into the health equity fund or the, or the new um, social health insurance, and designing new mechanisms that cover the significant indirect costs borne by patients, while also making sure patients are informed of what costs are, co are covered by existing schemes. Um, so HP Plus is taking forward these recommendations um, by uh, working with uh, the, the TB national program in Cambodia uh, to, on the joint program review and their new national strategic plan, uh, which is currently underway. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Again, any burning question for clarification? Otherwise, we have two more presentations to go. And so I would like to welcome the sixth one. Um, it's a, the MIMA case. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, 
I'm Pyo Myung uh, from, P uh, from PSM Myanmar. This is my first time attending the uh, IEA Congress, and it's very exciting to share the, uh, our experience, uh, our pilot experience. And that could be said, the uh, first ever strategy purchasing pilot in Myanmar. And uh, here are the uh, co authors and my colleagues, and one of them is also attending here, and she will be presenting her abstract uh, uh, after this session. So first of all, I would like to give uh, the uh, background information and the, the, our pilot introduction to get a sense of the uh, current situation of Myanmar. So the, uh, uh, according, to, uh, according to the uh, demographic and health uh, survey uh, taken in 2015, uh, so in Myanmar, the 31% of under five fever cases received health care from the uh, private sector, which means the private sector plays a significant role in health provision in Myanmar. And according to the uh, World Bank uh, uh, report, 35% uh, of population, they are paying out of pocket for their health care. And uh, the government of Myanmar, they, uh, to target those challenges, uh, the government of Myanmar, they developed a concrete national health plan to achieve the uh, universal health coverage by 2013. So it's a 15 years uh, a national health plan, and in, in, in the national health plan, the government uh, will, be engage, uh, will engage with the uh, public sectors, private sectors, NGOs, and other health organizations for the uh, conflict-affected areas. So being a uh, PSI is a uh, non-profit organization, you know, we, uh, the, based in Washington, and PSI Myanmar has a social rights network, which we call the uh, Sun Quality Health Network, that, have, uh, that has uh, uh, about 1,200 uh, general practitioners uh, all over the country. So uh, being a franchisor of a social rights network, PSI, we would like to uh, support our national health plan by piloting a, a project, uh, the strategy purchasing from the uh, uh, private sectors. So we piloted the, uh, the activity in 2017. So uh, the main objectives of our pilot is to expand the uh, service coverage uh, for the uh, financial production and to improve the uh, healthcare access for the uh, low-income people. And we uh, purchased the uh, basic package of service uh, from, the, uh, from our Sun Quality Health Clinics that includes the uh, five uh, health area, which are the uh, end of five child health, reproductive health, and then the uh, communicable diseases, non-communicable diseases, and then the uh, general illness. So, we use the uh, missed uh, provider, provider payment uh, mechanism that includes the uh, capitation for the mainstream, and then the, uh, the uh, performance-based incentive and the uh, co-payment. Uh, the co-payment is, uh, is, is a little amount of, uh, by the beneficiary, which is uh, equivalent to um, three cents in US dollars. So in, in the pilot, we enrolled to the, uh, about uh, 2,000 poor households that have uh, about 7,300 uh, beneficiaries. So the, uh, for the method, uh, during the uh, beneficiary registration, we collected the, uh, the individual characteristics like the uh, age, gender, the edu uh, education, occupation, and then the, uh, the household uh, socioeconomic status, household had, uh, education and occupation, and then the, uh, the distance in kilometer to the assigned clinic uh, from the uh, resident households. And then the, uh, we recorded the uh, service utilization data for the first uh, six months, as is the outcome variable. And then we used the uh, statistic tool, the uh, STATA 13, to examine the, the associated factors with the uh, service utilization. So the, uh, the particular objectives of, of our survey is to assess the, uh, the uptake by the health areas and then the, uh, to identify the FedEx data with the uh, service utilization. So here are our, our findings. So the first one is the, uh, the uh, utilization by the health areas. So as you all can see, the, uh, the, the majority of the, uh, the utilization is for the uh, general illness, uh, which is about 80% of the uh, total share, followed by the uh, non-communicable diseases. So during the first six months, 16.4% uh, of the uh, total beneficiaries, uh, about 1,000 and 200 uh, individuals, they visited the clinics. And how does it reflect with our competition, or with our expedition by the uh, competition model? So uh, we expected that the, uh, there will be 5.7 visits per capita per year by, uh, by our initial model. And then we estimated that the, uh, the, uh, the majority of the, uh, the utilization would be by the uh, NCDs. I have to admit that the, uh, we calculated uh, this competition model with the, uh, uh, the best data source uh, that, uh, which are available. And then the, uh, it is quite different uh, with the, uh, the actual uh, service utilization. So, and then yeah, we ran the uh, multivariate uh, uh, logistic regression to examine the, uh, the FedEx associated with the uh, uh, utilization. And among the, uh, the uh, FedEx, uh, the, uh, this full FedEx,
uh, are significant with the uh, service utilization. So the first one is the, uh, the, is the, uh, the age of the uh, beneficiaries. We divided the, the age into the five groups. And then it is significant that the, the beneficiaries uh, fall in, uh, who are 30 and above years of age, and also the, uh, the elderly person, they visited the clinics more than that of the, uh, the NF5 child that we took a reference. And the second one, uh, second one is the agenda. Uh, the um, female beneficiaries, they, they were more likely to visit, uh, to visit the clinics uh, compared to the uh, uh, male beneficiaries. And then the, another significant uh, factor is the uh, proximity. So the, uh, the, the, the households uh, that are located uh, more than the, uh, one, kilometer, one kilometer from their assigned clinics, they were less likely to visit the clinics and that of the, uh, the beneficiaries located within the uh, one kilometer to the assigned clinics. And then we, for the socioeconomic status of the houses, we reference the national quintile, and then the the, uh, the, uh, the lowest quintile, the, the beneficiaries of uh, lowest quintile uh, houses, they were more likely to visit the clinics compared to the uh, better of beneficiaries. So this is the uh, trend of the uh, service utilization of first six months. It reached its peak in June and July, the month four and month five, which is the uh, rainy season in Myanmar. Many people. Uh, suffered from the uh, season of flu, and many children uh, they suffer from diarrhea. And the total visit is the, about 2,800 visits, minimum is one, the maximum is 37 visits in the uh, first six months. And then we ran the multivariate uh, linear regression to examine the, the Fed associated with the frequency of the clinic visits. As the same with the above uh, findings, these four uh, factors have uh, the uh, significant relation uh, with the uh, frequency of the clinic visits. So the, uh, the uh, beneficiaries of the reproductive age elderly person, they were more likely to visit the visit frequently than that of the uh, NF5 child. And also the uh, male benef uh, beneficiaries, they were less likely to visit the clinics um, less frequently uh, compared to the uh, female beneficiaries. And also the, uh, the proximity of the socioeconomic status is the same. The, uh, the, benef the beneficiaries located within the uh, one kilometer, they visited the clinics frequently than that of the other ben beneficiaries located uh, uh, far from the uh, one uh, kilometer from the assigned clinics. Also the uh, socioeconomic status the lowest the lowest quantile they were more like uh, they were more, more likely to visit the clinics frequently to compare to that of the uh, uh, beneficiaries of four and quintile four and five so here are our conclusions and uh, recommendations. So the, uh, according to uh, our findings, the strategy purchasing from the uh, private GPs uh, actually can improve the uh, healthcare access of the uh, low, low income households. And then the uh, women and elderly person, they use their, uh, the health services compared to other uh, age group. And according to the, uh, according to the service utilization by the health area, not only the uh, communicable and NCDs, we should also pay attention to the uh, general illness, which is the largest share of the total utilization, and which uh, the general illness uh, should include in the package of service and scale of the uh, activity. And also another significant factor is that the uh, proximity is uh, really an uh, important issue. The clinics uh, uh, near to enroll beneficiaries uh, should be recruited. Thanks, the Thank you. Since the last presentation is also related to MIMA, can we have the yes, last please. presentation? Yes, please. Thank you. And uh, for your information, uh, we have a USC working group, and then the, we uh, write up uh, about the uh, progress of our project. And the, if you're interested, you can visit my website, and the, uh, there are six learning briefs we have uh, uploaded. And there are two uh, also coming soon. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you so much for coming to our session. Uh, it's just uh, Gopiumya explained. Uh, we are very uh, happy and excited to share the findings from our very first pilot uh, in Myanmar in the context of a universal health coverage. So I'll be presenting on behalf of my team. Uh, our study is about the family planning used at uh, our uh, strategic purchasing pilot clinics. Now let me skip the introduction section 
because my colleague just explained. But I will like to uh, add a little bit about the contraceptive uh, prevalence rate in Myanmar. Even though uh, there is a significant progress in uh, recent years, but we still have like 51% uh, of contraceptive prevalence rate. In Myanmar, the mo uh, most commonly used uh, contraceptive methods are injection, uh, three-month injections, and daily oral contraceptive pills, so which is about 28% and 14% uh, from the demographic from the recent demographic and health survey. So I would like to explain a little bit about our pilot project setting. In our pilot, we selected two uh, townships in Yangon. Uh, that, that is the uh, map of a uh, Yangon region. We selected one peri-urban townships and one urban townships uh, where uh, most of the residents are poor. So uh, we enrolled about 2,000 households for the project with uh, 7,200 individuals. So these individuals were issued the health card, the, the registration card. And uh, they are assigned to a specific clinic near the household. Uh, normally, these individuals, these beneficiaries, have access to a wide range of providers, uh, from the pharmacy to like hospitals, because they reside in Yango region. So, they uh, they normally travel about uh, thirty minutes to one and a half hour to access these uh, types of providers. These are the township locations. Uh, our paper uh, first objective is to examine where the, the, our, uh, whether the pilot clinics could actually reduce uh, the end user cost for family planning user. And uh, we also would like to identify which are the factors that associated with uh, family planning use at our pilot clinic. So we extracted that they, unlike uh, Gopiumya uh, paper, we extracted our data from the household survey, which was done six months after the pilot has been initiated. So there are 2,322 women participated in the survey. The survey questionnaire cover the women's demographic, their education and occupation status, their household socioeconomic status, their residential area, and their health care ownership status, and their usage of different family planning uh, services and related costs, and also uh, their characteristics of the GP that they are assigned to. So we have the approval from PSI Research Ethics Board and a local RAB. So for the first objective, we would like to compare the end user cost at a strategic purchasing clinic and GPs. I will explain why we did the, 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 the such comparison. We did the t-test for comparing the end user cost and uh, for a better sense of uh, the local currency. The one US dollar is equal to uh, 1,570 local currency. For the second objective, uh, we first look at the different in percentages of uh, use of uh, family planning service at our pilot clinics and other GPs, and we did like chi-square and uh, uh, multivariate uh, regression analysis. Uh, all the analysis were done by using starter package 14. So the first uh, ch uh, figure shows that uh, the different sources of family planning services uh, that the women received uh, who participated in the survey. So as you can see there, uh, the first source is uh, the GP doctors, by pharmacy, and followed by our pilot clinics. As you can see in the second, so as I just explained, the most popular method is three-month injection followed by oral daily contraceptive pill. We do have a few users of uh, IUDs and implants, but these methods are not still very popular in Myanmar. This chart shows the women's uh, sources of uh, family planning and uh, the providers that they went to. As you can see there, the highlighted, the strategic purchasing scheme clinic and GPs, uh, the women receive all four types of 
family planning services from these two providers. And from other providers, they receive only one or two types of family planning methods. For the end user cost comparison, we selected these two because, just Gopyomya explained, the strategy purchasing pilots are GP. These are basically medical doctors. And also the other GPs are medical doctors. So we would like to compare the end user cost at these different uh, clinics because they are similar in terms of provider qualifications and similar in terms of the service availability. So we compare the end user cost uh, first uh, for any type of family planning service and then for each type of family planning service. So as you can see, the family planning use end user cost is reduced at our SBS clinic compared to uh, uh, going to other uh, GPs. And the results are significant for any type and for three-month injection and implant user. We also, uh, for the uh, second part of our study, we like to see what are the factors associated with uh, going to our pilot clinic for FB use. So first, uh, we would like to see, is there any difference in the, our pilot clinic goers and other GP clinic goers by user and clinic factors? We look at age group, education, occupation, uh, the clinic provider gender, because in our country context, women are very specific about the gender of the provider, especially with the family planning, like in other Asian countries, and also uh, the total household, memory, household uh, member size, and we also uh, included like uh, whether the women is a continued family planning user or not. And in the uh, the table, as you see, the residential township, household, their social, uh, household socioeconomic status, their cut ownership status, and type of FE. So the goers, uh, the percentages are different, and for these uh, variables, the, uh, the, the percentages are different, and these are statistically significant. So in the multivariate logistic regression analysis, we found that uh, the residential township uh, cut ownership status, type of FB that the women use, and the provider gender. These factors are found to be associated with the use of family planning uh, service at our pilot clinic. And as you can see, these are positively related, and the uh, findings are, the results are statistically significant. And we reached to a conclusion that uh, this is the early findings from our pilot. We were using uh, that finding. We would like to conclude that the family planning service use and user cost is reduced at our pilot clinic, but specifically for a three-month injection user and implant user. And we, our team, um, uh, thought that this is uh, such a promising finding for us because this is the early phase of our pilot and Myanmar is still on the way to achieve the uh, FB 2020 goals. As you can see in the introduction section and in our, our uh, presentation, the long-term methods are still not popular. So we can use this uh, to promote our family planning services for, especially for poor women. And we have a plan uh, for future program uh, activities like uh, recruitment of more provide recruitment of more beneficiaries and contracting more GPs. So we can use the findings such as uh, user and clinic factors could be useful for uh, future program activities. And thank you so much for listening. Okay, so that's uh, the seven presentations we have for this section. We have a very exciting, you know, showcase of uh, various countries in the region. Uh, we have uh, Myanmar, we have Cambodia, India, China, and um, what's the other one? Um, I was not... Indonesia, yes, the single payer system in Indonesia. So very exciting showcase of all these countries. And then we started with... Uh, 
nice overview of this primary care intervention literature review. Uh, so now we have um, roughly 25 minutes open to the floor. Should you have any questions? Yes, please. So excellent presentations, uh, and I just wanted to appreciate Myanmar for their groundwork. Um, another question, uh, I wanted to actually understand the costs to the end user, were they direct or indirect costs, or do you have a separate, uh, you, do you have a disaggregate value for each? Microphone is over there. So we looked at the direct cost first. We uh, are still thinking to include the indirect cost in the future uh, research. The, the direct cost includes both the transportation and the medical costs or? Yes, both. Okay, so do you have the disaggregate values for medical yeah, I, and non-medical? I did have it, but I, the, the results are similar. So we would like to show the, the direct cost for end user only in the presentation. So this is part of the, the paper. So we will, we have a plan to write the full uh, manuscript for future. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Sunita Sharma, Health Policy Plus Project Palladium. Thank you very much for such an excellent session. My question is for Cambodia. Uh, thank you very much for sharing findings on the time modeling and all that is scale up, recommendation about is scale up and how it can really help reduce financial burden. So I'm interested knowing how we are working with policymakers. Are we sharing the findings? Are we organizing dialogues? How we are informing policy decisions? Yeah, no, uh, good question. Thank you, Sunita. Um, so I think there's two, two, two parts. One is that during the uh, conducting of the investment case, we engaged with the National TB Program and uh, other in-country stakeholders to make sure that they were well aware of what the modelling uh, entailed, as well as, uh, as making final decisions and improving uh, different scenario options based on um, something that can be tailored to the Cambodian context. And you could see that through like the Pagoda screening um, scale up, for example. Uh, and then now that the investment case has been finalized and approved by the National TB Program, we're using it uh, to support them with their joint program review and their national um, strategic plan development, which is currently underway and will serve the country for the next five years. So I think this is a key, uh, the, the investment case is a key input for them to, to um, make those decisions. Okay. Hi, Lauren Suchman, uh, University of California, San Francisco. Uh, my question is also for the Myanmar team. So thank you, first of all, for a nice presentations, and it's great to see you prove uh, proof of concept for st strategic purchasing in Myanmar. Um, my question is similar to actually um, the earlier question about end user costs. So we have a lot of evidence that um, capitation can, can be interpreted by providers as a cap on individual spending as opposed to a risk pool across their patient population. And so then what tends to happen is they reach that cap for a patient and then they'll charge them for whatever goes over that cap. So I was just wondering if you have data on what patients were charged in terms of what they were supposed to be charged versus what they were ultimately charged, if there were any issues around um, sort of informal fees. So uh, during the uh, beneficiary uh, registration, we communicated with the uh, uh, the uh, with our beneficiary that the uh, the uh, copayment uh, is the uh, the fixed rate, and we we said that for the only for the uh, five hundred checks, which is equivalent to three cents in USD, and there's no informal fees to the uh, uh, service providers. But I will. Uh, but, but, uh, before the question, I, uh, I would like to add uh, one uh, one point here to uh, uh, to the question. Also, the the uh, the cap uh, uh, copayment is five hundred checks. 
three cents in USD. There might be, you know, there might be other services uh, not uh, included in the uh, package of service. So the uh, the women they might have to give uh, some extra money for the uh, uh, to the providers for other services not included in the uh, package of service, like the uh, multivitamix and other the NHS space, something like that. Yes, thank you. Naoki oh, I'm from Tokyo, Japan. About the uh, Indonesian case, um, the private sector appears to be grossly underfunded. How do they balance the differences? Uh, is there more upcoding, or how does the private sector manage to finance itself? Thank you. Um so we, that's a good question. Um, one of the challenges which I mentioned in uh, the introduction, the rationale behind behind the study is is just that that private sector hospitals are needing to finance um, the, their services based on direct revenue. Um, so part of the question of why why efficiency the camera close to you a became bit. a question is is just that whether to understand that within the current system or the changes with JCAN introduction whether hospitals were cutting costs or trying to reduce uh, input costs and unfortunately our study based on data availability only looked at technical efficiency as opposed to allocative um, so we're not really considering costs that the private sector is uh, responsible for. Uh, well, um, from the data, I could not see any um, any clear way that to understand the question because the private sector, the results you found did not relate to the original questions you had about the funding of the private sector. Well, our, we we use data from a. Um, more broad uh, survey of private hospitals. Yes. <laughs> um, so we did get some information on revenue it's in addition to profit and um, capacity and utilization. But specifically, the question of efficiency was um, only related to, to those imp physical inputs and outputs that we discussed. So it's not that the question changed, but that what data we had available um, is how we framed our research study for this. Well, I think if you could frame it more directly to the issues relevant, uh, it would be more. Thank you. Any more questions? Okay. Okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, it's very interesting and actually very promising to see the results from Myanmar. Uh, that uh, you have successfully benefited the bottom 20%. Uh, so I'm wondering uh, what the team thought the pilot has done right uh, to make sure that the poor actually benefited. Uh, and uh, is there, so in addition to the access, so do you think there's any other implication on the quality of care as well? Is it uh, being evaluated in some way or not? And uh, uh, whatever the lessons learned from the successful piloting, do you think that's uh, um, generalizable when you are doing a more um, sizable uh, exercise? Thank you. That's the uh, uh, excellent point. Uh, actually, in our the, uh, uh, performance-based incentive scheme, we set a target that the, the providers, if the providers meet the uh, the fifty percent, uh, not not fifty, if the providers meet the. Uh, at least 80% uh, of the our service delivery standards, they were received a bonus or like you know the uh, the 10% uh, uh, of the, uh, the uh, quarterly uh, computation. So we uh, evaluate the uh, providers uh, providers quality of care uh, by quarterly, and uh, according to our results, the uh, uh, they have the uh, the great results for the quality of care. Thank you. Uh, my name is Zelana Vulko. I'm from Thinkwell. I have a question from colleagues from Myanmar. First of all, thank you so much for presenting the findings of the pilot. 
Um, I was wondering uh, if there are any plans to expand this pilot to public providers or to ethnic health organizations that cover this, uh, that cover populations in conflicted areas. Um, also, if there are any plans to expand in other townships, not only townships from Yangon, and um, if these results are presented to the ministry on what are the reactions and what are the plans of the ministry. Thank you. Thank you for the question. So to respond to your first question, uh, we uh, currently our pilot is uh, contracting the GP network because BSI Myanmar has a network with GP. And uh, we have a few other uh, partner organizations. They are working on uh, engaging with the ethnic health group, group organization. But I think the Ministry of Health is... a uh, is uh, taking care of the public provider part, but it's not fully established yet. And uh, this is the first pilot in uh, Yango region. And currently, we have another pilot project, which is in Chin State, which is uh, very different in terms of geography and context. So it's still very early. Uh, the pilot is only about one year. And we also did the same uh, household survey and data collection for programs. So we are working on analyzing these results in like maybe next year we will be presenting the results from both pilot projects. Just to add uh, one point uh, uh, to your question. So the, uh, the, uh, uh, actually the, our Ministry of Health and Sports, they are now planning to purchase the, uh, the uh, inpatient service from the, uh, the uh, public sector uh, hospitals by using the uh, DRGs, which is a, uh, a good opportunity for Myanmar people. And then uh, we have a, uh, in, in Ministry of Health and Sports, there's a unit called uh, National Health Line Implementation Monitoring Unit, we call in uh, NIMU. Uh, we have a great relationship with uh, that unit, and we usually share our findings to the uh, NIMU to feed the, uh, our National Health Plan and the National Health Finance Strategy. Yes, thank you. Please identify yourself first. Uh, my name is Grace Chi from Results for Development Institute. Um, I have a question about the medical debt in China study that was presented. Um, did, w w did your study include any information around, you know, whether these causes given the prevalence of insurance coverage, whether the, the, the expenses that were incurred were legitimate expenses out that were not covered by insurance, were they informal payments? It, seems, it just seems relatively high, uh, given that you know, most of the population is covered under some form of health insurance. Okay, thank you for your questions. It's a, um, yeah, we, we've considered about uh, the questions um, if they don't have the uh, medical insurance, especially the basic medical insurance, uh, what will it uh, influence the medical debt? And uh, we also uh, include these uh, uh, variables into the analysis, but uh, um, maybe the model didn't, uh, uh, maybe the, 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 influence, uh, the influence is not in significant uh, in the model, so uh, we think only uh, several scenarios, like uh, uh, if elderly have the uh, basic insurance, and uh, in this this scenario will protect their families from medical uh, medical debt. But uh, uh, in other scenarios, like students has uh, basic insurance, or the uh, middle-aged people has basic insurance. Mm, in this scenario, the, uh, their uh, family are intended to uh, in occur medical debt, or mm, and uh, uh, and we also test for the uh, students or the child under five years old, or the uh, elderly, or the middle-aged people if they don't have the uh, basic medical insurance. Uh, this scenario didn't. Uh, seen it mm, uh, significant in this model. So, uh, so we think, um, mm, according to a, an early empirical studies, they also found the hospitalization and hospitalization affect the uh, medical debt. So we, we think uh, it's the uh, students whose hospitalization uh, affect the uh, medical debt impact. Okay, thank you.
Uh, my name is Xiaoling Wei from University of Toronto. Uh, I, I have seen that you have done very great studies using person-to-person power of financing to affect the care. Uh, I worked in the countries like Indonesia, Myanmar, uh, Cam Cambodia. So one thing I find that is uh, the capacity of provider. For example, if I take my student to put the mask in Indonesia in the, in the morning, I do not find a doctor. I can only find a nurse. <coughs> and doctors would work until just 1.30 the day, and then they do their private practice. So my question is that we are doing lots of financing studies and trying to use finance to change the behavior. But in the beginning, how much we have done to increase the capacity of the providers? So that is the key question. Without the capacity, we would not have the care. My second would be a comment. So if you look at the, you know, the rapid universal health coverage achievement, that has been achieved a lot in China, in the rural areas, in the past 10 years. So we have done a kind of commentary to the BMG some time ago, looking at the important message there. So one policy message is about purchasing, so it's a kind of uh, uh, provincial and, the and the central government uh, match the funding. But another important factor is about capacity. So they had the, the kind of primary care physician's capacity. They trained them before this kind of purchasing uh, being into place, et cetera. So the capacity actually is a pre-existing condition we had to look at before providing the money. I don't know if you agree with that or not. Uh, yeah, no, I, I think that's a very great point. And we, we certainly, I think nobody would disagree with the fact that we do need to have enough capacity for providers to, um, to, to deliver the services, um, you know, for the financing to work. Um, and for us to see like the, the, the desired increase in utilization. Uh, I think for, from the Cambodia perspective, I can just say that you know, there is a lot of work at the moment to see how we can leverage the financing schemes and the, and the scale up and the health financing reforms that are going on, whether that be SHI or the health equity fund reforms, um, to see that at least that TB can be put on an equal footing uh, with other uh, primary care uh, services. And so that would at least uh, not disincentivize providers from uh, delivering TB care. Hello, uh, Sunita Sharma from Palladium. My question is for uh, your analysis for India, like you've done, and thank you very much for looking at not just economic indicators, but also interaction with gender and location and all different. So what do you recommend for policy makers where they're, they're trying to design equitable policies or rights-based policies, how they should look at data, what kind of some of the interventions they should be thinking about, because that it becomes really complex when you see the interaction. And so uh, what do you recommend? Thank you so much for asking this question. Um, so uh, as a part of a larger study, uh, uh, in Kerala, actually, what we are doing is trying to get data. Closer to you. OK, sorry. So we are trying to get. Uh, the utilization data for insurance to inform the, and we are working with the DHS government of Kerala to inform them uh, what what will come out of uh, the um, uh, the household survey. We are trying to um, uh, uh, do it in uh, Kerala, and um, so um, I think that um, that. Uh, First of all, that we need to have uh, like proper, uh, there's a lack of data. And um, especially, uh, so what we have done as, uh, like I was also working with the government of India for three years prior to working here at George. So we informed the Ministry of Statistical and Pro Program Implementation that uh, the, the data that they have right now, we do not have data on who utilized and uh, 
those who utilized, what schemes they were covered in. And I think that we need to have that data to look at, at to, to, which will help in designing the uh, scheme, uh, the implementation of the scheme. And we need to have more intersectoral research, more qualitative research as well to look, look into, uh, which will help uh, uh, design our uh, scheme properly. Yes, uh, oh, actually, I have a follow-up question on, on that. So if my memory is correct, you sh according to the CI, um, you actually show that female, um, sort of the pro poor tendency is stronger among female than male. I mean, to, uh, in terms of the under this public health insurance scheme. Am I correct? Because Basically, you see the pro poor. So when, we, uh, we, when we see the curve, we see that, that it is pro poor, but stronger uh, strongly among pro poor. Female. Uh, uh -huh. Among female, I, uh, but the thing is that I wanted like basically the curve to be more concentrated among the poorer groups. Basically, the coverage to be more concentrated among the poorer groups, but this was not the case. Though it was more in women, but the concentration was more among the upper two quantiles. So this was what, what I was expecting and not getting. I, I was wondering, does it imply that male actually have a better access to private health insurance in India? or that's not the case? That's not the case, but, but usually uh, what, what was the scenario was uh, the, the scheme that was implemented at central level, uh, the Rashtra Swasthya Bhima Yojana, it has an inclusion criteria of five household members earlier, and uh, usually research studies showed that um, women were uh, left out uh, due to the inclusion criteria. So now the scheme has removed this criteria uh, of five, uh, covering the five members, and uh, so the next data uh, when it comes in, I think, 2018, that how, like, some change or not. Thank you. Uh, Matt Guilford from Teleneur Health in Bangladesh. Uh, just a question to the Myanmar team. Um, so I think the data that you had on the service utilization was really interesting, this shift between what you projected versus the actual. Um, how much of that do you think was based on the actual services that were delivered versus how providers were using those categories, right? So the fact that you had sort of general, what was the term, general medicine or general health, is it that actually they were more general issues or do you think it's also that providers were just kind of ticking that box because they didn't want to spend a lot of time doing coding. How do you how do you think about that? Yes, uh, uh, that's an uh, uh, excellent question. So we also uh, uh, thought about uh, uh, like that uh, 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 by these findings. So um, uh, actually, uh, we set uh, two uh, kind of uh, co-payments uh, 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 at the initial of the pi uh, pilot. So we said uh, about. Uh, three uh, U, uh, three cent uh, U.S. dollar for other uh, health services, but for general illness, we said about like uh, nearly uh, eight cents in USD. So that's uh, we thought uh, whether the uh, providers are you know app coding to get the uh, more copayment, and then the, uh, the they wanted to charge more, or to, and then they, they take the uh, the general illness. But the uh, for that concern, and then the, uh, we also uh, consulted with the uh, Ministry of Health and Sports. The uh, as a group, we decided to get uh, the, to to make the uh, the same copayment for every uh, health services. Also, after that, the the general illness trend is still you know the uh, the majority of the uh, service utilization. So, and then uh, with that concern, we also and, and later after I think after uh, tw uh, twelve months later. We decided to use the ICD-10 to make the diagnosis of the uh, 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 the health services to avoid the uh, the, the round uh, round diagnosis of the uh, the, uh, the health services they provided to the uh, beneficiaries. It's still remaining that the uh, the general industry a major review of the uh, service utilization. Yes, thank you. Any more questions? We have. Uh, Roughly four more minutes. Okay, um, I actually have a question for the China study. You have student hospitalization as one of the factor, and what's the rationale of including this student hospitalization? So is that like a family member who is a student and who was ever hospitalized? 
Is that how the question was phrased in the in the survey? It's like I mean, it, it could be any family member. This is my point. But why specifically for a student? I'm we, we are not uh, particular uh, focused on the student. We also uh, look the middle aged people, the elderly, and the children under five, and also the students. And uh, as you know, in the um, basic medical insurance scheme in China, um, um, students. Uh, usually only have a uh, residence um, medical insurance and uh, uh, their protection is much lower yes. than than the uh, insurance for adults so and uh, um, and maybe less than one percent of Chinese people has uh, private uh, medical insurance or business medical insurance so, um, so um, so we want to uh, see that uh, the um, basic medical insurance, when it comes to uh, different types of people, uh, how it can protect them from uh, long-term <laughs> medical uh, financial burden. Thank medical. you. Thank you. Oh, there's one more. This could be the last one. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for your presentations today. They were all really excellent and um, gave us a lot of food for thought. My name is Linda Kahalan, and I'm from USAID Washington. Um, as a donor organization, we really look for um, results being implemented into policy or change uh, within countries. So a question for any, really, of the presenters. What is your view on that in terms of a researcher? Um, do you feel responsibility to make recommendations forward? Um, and how much effort is put towards that um, as you're designing your studies? Um, it's 10 already, so if you can just give quick feedback, like one minute per country. <laughs> Uh, so thanks, thanks, Linda. I think I, I, for Cambodia, I've already spoken a little bit about how we're using the investment case. Um, for, for Indonesia, I think we, we have, um, beyond just Rebecca's analysis, a, a range of studies um, and an analytical pieces that we're, we're using to try and influence um, future policy direction. And we've, we've been doing that for a couple of years now. So I'll just stop there so the others can get a chance as well. I'd like to share what we usually uh, do for the pilot. So uh, every six months, we have a meeting with uh, the Ministry of Health and uh, the donors for the pilot for the pilot results. And we are uh, using the pilot uh, data and the health uh, survey data. We we have some recommendations, and based on these results, we have uh, a modification. We make modifications in the the program design with the uh, inputs from uh, Ministry of Health, Technical Working Group, and the donors. Yeah, um, I think it's uh, similar to the question that uh, she asked. And um, as I informed that uh, we are doing a uh, st similar study, our household, our primary data survey in Kerala. And uh, we are working with the government of Kerala along, uh, alongside. We are also looking at the facility data, the household data, and um, and also uh, focus group discussions. And uh, we are going to triangulate. And as we are working with the government of Kerala, we are going to uh, inform the. We are working with the policymakers uh, for this. And I I'll do the similar uh, study, and we'll see how like. If we do the household survey, are the results similar or are, is there any difference? I'll, I'll just agree with everyone. I think it's very important and it was a big uh, justification for the study that we did to try and involve the uh, policy makers from the start rather than trying to make our research fit later to try to get, be answering the questions that are, that are important. Okay, so, so thank you for uh, focusing on the Asia and uh, um, maybe 
uh, maybe I think uh, we, we still need to um, make promotion in uh, in the uh, insurance or the uh, or the others uh, basic uh, uh, health slides to to improve the problem. Thank you. Uh, I think that concludes our uh, session today. And thank you very much for uh, coming to this session. And please join me for a big round of applause for our presenters for getting an excellent job done in eight minutes. <laughs>